Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Santa Monica Public Library. Uh, my name is Nancy Bender, and I'm a programming librarian here at SMPL, and I'm part of a small group that coordinates adult programs throughout the month, every month, every year. Um, before we get started, I just want to mention a few cool events that are coming up. On Thursday, November 13th, we have classical guitarist Peter Fletcher in concert. Um, Gilligan's Island actress Dawn Wells, who played Mary Ann, is going to be here on Saturday, November 22nd. Uh, we have Oscar-nominated costume designer Deborah Nudelman, Nudelman, sorry, Landis, and she's going to discuss the Hollywood costume exhibit uh, on Tuesday, December 2nd. And I just saw that exhibit last week, and if you haven't gone yet, I highly recommend it. It's a great exhibit. And then um, on December 10th, we're going to have a screening and discussion of the documentary GMOOMG. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, out in the entrance area, you might have noticed we have our calendar of events, so certainly feel free to grab one if any of those things interest you. Uh, but for tonight, we have an excellent program as well. Um, this evening's program is part of the library's um, quarterly farmer's market panel discussion series. And tonight, our panelists are going to discuss the California drought, and they're going to attempt to answer the question, what is the big picture? So first, please join me in welcoming Jody Lowe from the Santa Monica Farmer's Market. Thank you, Nancy, and good evening, everyone. So I'm Jody Lowe from the Farmer's Market Department here, and we're very excited to be presenting this What is the Big Deal About the California Drought tonight? And since California began irrigating crops in the mid-1880s, the complexity of overlapping water allotments, contracts, and water distribution systems has grown to where California has 600 water and irrigation districts, 515 groundwater basins, and 13 major reservoirs. Surface waters, such as Owens Lake and Tulare Lake, once the largest body of fresh water west of the Mississippi, has disappeared. And the annual mountain snowpack, which provides 75% of the West's water was at an all-time low in 2013, which was also the driest in 119 years of record. Additional water supply from the Colorado River Basin, which supplies seven states, including California, has been over-allocated by 30% in the last decade. With the lack of rain and snow, underground water reserves are being pumped at an unprecedented rate. California is the only state which does not regulate its groundwater through recently passed, le although, pardon me, recently passed legislation will begin to address this issue. California farmers are facing an uncertain future where effective water resource management will be key. If only we could turn back and heed the admonition contained in John Wellesley Powell's 1879 groundbreaking report on the lands of the arid region of the United States. If Congress fails to move quickly to take ownership of the water that flows freely over stream beds and into rivers, the, we the West will soon be monopolized by big business. Water must be regarded as a commons like public land. Otherwise, said Powell, the demise of individual homesteaders might quickly grow into a national disaster that would follow a, pr a predictable pattern, speculation, water monopoly, land monopoly, erosion, corruption, and widespread, widespread bankruptcy. Our two panelists tonight will give us an overview of California's current water reserves and how all users may be able to access our most pre precious resource. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve Murray from Murray Family Farms, and he'll be followed by Kim O'Kane from the Office of Sustainability from the City of Santa Monica. Thank you, Jody. I have to confess, when I was growing up, I had a crush on uh, Mary Ann <laughs> on the Gilligan's Island, so. <laughs> oh, we're, we're on, right? Yeah. Um, so anyway, there's a couple things as far as um, what I wanted to tell you about. One is, I'm Steve Murray. Um, I went, I'm, I'm actually originally from Riverside, graduated from uh, UCR, University of California at Riverside. And while I was um, going to school there, I got a job working at the local Sunkist orange juice plant. But they fired me because I couldn't concentrate. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 
I've got about four things about Bakersfield that are unique that many of you may not know. The first is that Bakersfield was founded by Colonel Baker. His wife died, he was a widower, he remarried one of the Bandini daughters, and if you know the history of this area, that Bandini basically secularized the missions. He was the one that sold the lands into private, into, into the, the um, the, the, the land grants. And so he ended up getting some of those and his daughter owned the Santa Monica, Rancho Santa Monica, and so Colonel Baker married her. Bakersfield used to own Santa Monica. <laughs> Which makes us feel good up there when you come down here and see <laughs> the, the contrast. <laughs> you know, one of the contrasts that you see is here, everybody's so fit because you all walk and ride bikes and everything to work in Bakersfield. Everything's spread out and you drive your car. And so uh, the Kern County leads the state in obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. And so the people are just generally chubbier. But new studies are showing that women that carry a little extra weight live longer than their husbands who mention it. <laughs> <laughs> Water rights in California all started in Bakersfield. The Kern River going through Bakersfield went out into the Button Willow area and Harry Miller, Miller and Lux, it was the largest cattle operation, privately held you know, farming company in California at the time. Um, was taking that water and irrigating pasture land. And then, um, then Hageman came in and bought the lands upstream and he diverted the water. And so the river stopped flowing and the cowboys came on their horses with guns drawn and dynamite to blow up the dam. And it ended up in an 18 year lawsuit. A lot of water rights and a lot of issues in California, all the way back to the Spaniards, um, really ended up in long, long drawn out uh, legal fights. And Harry Miller won. And, it, and between Miller and Hageman, they literally divided up all of the water water in the Kern River. Even the city of Bakersfield wasn't entitled to water at that time. And so in that settlement, basically, what was established was the first one to use the water, no matter where you are on the stream, has the highest rights. And then the second part of that is the highest rights is also the, the, the first, first choice. So that's never been challenged, the, the highest usage, but the first right is the standard. And so everywhere in the West that you go today, the water law is based on first use, first right. And so when you look at a lot of the water projects that you see in California, a lot of those started off in the mining industries where the diverting the water and, and plaster mining the hillsides, those canals then became the irrigation canals. And if you go down in the Owens Valley where they were the first, not Owens Valley, but down in the, uh, Imperial Valley, you know, Coachella, that area, they were some of the first ones to divert Colorado River, Colorado River water. And so they have primary rights over uh, Metropolitan who came in later to divert that water. So first use, highest use. Um, that was those things. Uh, what else is there? There's, um, um, I think that covers that. So anyway, let's go on with our presentation. Uh, what I'm going to discuss, or what the agenda is, first is talk about the damming of California, the history of the water projects that exist in the state. Is that water is a very complicated affair when, a few years back, I don't know now, maybe six or eight years ago, Georgia had a drought, and they never had one before, and they didn't know what to do. Who had the, who had the rights to the water in the lakes in Georgia because they didn't know what to do with it. Right now in California and, and all of the West, it's all based on first use. Now groundwater is a separate issue. Right now that there is no adjudication in the Central Valley and they're really if you have land and you haven't drilled a well and you're not pumping water in the future are you going to lose the right to be able to ever develop that land is some of the questions that are coming up with some of the new legislation but we're going to talk about the damming of the west uh, the state water project and that's the one that goes along the west side of the valley and then comes all the way over the hill and, and comes down into metropolitan 25 million people use that water the central valley project which was the federal project it's on the east side and that that's where we get our water so i'm going to go down from central valley to arvin edison to murray family farms talk briefly about three different things that are really affect, they're, they're big in the news. One is Proposition 1, what does it really mean? The second one is the State of California Center Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board's <laughs> um, uh, uh, order where they changed the rules basically and the ag industry really felt the way that you'll see as we go through these slides how water is divided up but this basically turns all of the water rights and all the water use as far as groundwater is concerned on its ear and we're starting over and in, in, the, in the end we have until 19 or 2020 to adjudicate basically the water rights in the valley and probably there's 80% of the water is 
there's about 20% more ground being farmed than there is water, and so you're going to see a, a significant reduction in acreage, and it's going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, and then the other one is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, which uh, is another issue. And it, it used to be that if you watered your fields and it ran into a stream and that ran into the ocean, then those are waters of, uh, of America, that you had to actually have plans in place to be sure that you didn't have fertilizers and other pollutants going into the water. But now what they're saying is when you water your field, you're polluting the ground. And so there's a lot of legislation, there's a lot of requirements in that that are coming up that are going to be ex particularly expensive for farmers. Uh, the big issue that we face in California is that where it rains is not where the people and most of the farmland is. So the, the, the water is up there and the farmland's down here. Uh, in this, this historic drought that we're having, Bakersfield usually averages about five inches of precipitation a year. In, in, in 2014, and this year, we got 1.3 inches of precipitation. So, I mean, literally, you know, I mean, there's, <laughs> that's, that's just, you know, it, really very severe as far as the drought is concerned. So if you want to talk about California water history, the first guy you start with is, uh, is, uh, is uh, William Mulholland. That um, He was the one that went up into the Owens Valley. He basically took a group of investors and, and collected $2 million and then went up in the Owens Valley and bought the entire Owens Valley for $2 million, came back down to LA, created uh, the LA Water Company, and, and, and sold it for $20 million. And so the investors that actually invested it got $10, 10, $10 on the dollar for every dollar they invested in Mulholland's project. Have you seen Chinatown and whatnot? You're familiar with that. And that was in 1913. At the same year, 1913, the city of San Francisco went up to Hetch Hetchy. Now you got Yosemite and the next valley over was was the next Yosemite, and that they, they went in and dammed that, and that became San Francisco's water supply. And the environmental groups at the time did not think that they could stop San Francisco from damming the, 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 the canyon. In retrospect, when it was over, they thought they'd made a mistake, that if they'd stood their ground, that maybe they could have stopped it. But, that, uh, I mean, it is it just, it, it was a, the second Yosemite, and it's now the water supply for San Francisco. That's also where they had the rim fire that I think 75,000 acres burned. Uh, the next water project that came along, um, uh, and I'm not familiar with the name of the river, but it's, um, it basically was called the, um, uh, the uh, this is the East Bay water supply, and so they basically dammed a river up in Northern California, and that uh, it was in 1929, so it's about 15, 16 years later that um, East Bay area got their water supply in place. Now down in Southern California in 1941, that's when um, Metropolitan Water District went over the Colorado River and brought the water in, and they have inferior water rights to the farmers that are down in the Coachella Valley. Uh, incidentally, when we were looking at the Owens Valley in the beginning, that it was 1913, but then in the 1920s, they went all the way up into Mono Lake and tapped those, those sources of water as well to expand their water supply. But uh, this was, so for, for the greater LA Basin area, they've got the Owens Valley water, now they've got the Colorado River water. And um, so, you know, just right during and at the end of the Depression in um, 1940, that basically this was one of the works programs. That the Shasta Dam was put in on the Sacramento River. It dammed five major rivers. And uh, it, started, um, it started the beginning of the, of the Central Valley Project, although the site says CVP. And then that was added on to in the 60s, where they started putting in the state water project, which is what you see in green along here. And what was, what's, what's unique about the state water project is that it was financed as a mortgage. And so when farmers use this water or the city of Los Angeles uses this water, every year you have a mortgage payment. It's not based on your water. You're not buying water, you're paying your mortgage payment. And that's significant as we go through some of the other issues. It was 1973 before the first water from Lake Shasta actually made it down to Southern California. So if you take a look, you got the west side of the valley, the, the state water project, and that uh, it, if you take a look at it, it's got about um, 3 million acre feet compared to the Central Valley Project with 7 million acre feet. So the Central Valley Project is getting its water out of um, 
you know, out of, um, out of um, the Friant Dam, which is the San Joaquin River. The State Water Project is coming out of the Feather River, Oroville, that area, and Lake Shasta. But you've got um, 20 million people getting their water from the State Water Project, and you've got 2 million people getting it out of the Central Valley Project. It was really an agricultural project, but it irrigates 3, 3 million acres of farmland. It's you know, multiple thousands of small family farms and medium-sized family farms. Originally, you couldn't water more than 160 acres. That was dropped a couple of years ago. Now you can water it. Larger corporate farms now can get the water as well, but before it was limited to 160 acres. But the, the state water project again, as a mortgage payment, so they pay payments every year, whereas the CVP, which is the federal project, is financed, and so they pay for the water that they get. Which, since I'm on that side, it makes me kind of happy when you don't get any water, you don't have to pay the full price. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you look down at Kern County, that what we're called is we're called part of the Greater Tulare Basin watershed. And so there's a number of different sources of water. You've got the Kern River coming in here, and it delivers on average about 745,000 acre feet of water as that's coming down the Kern River. And there's districts that were set up specifically at that time to get that water. And so that's their piece of their pie. That is their water source. They either get water from the Kern River or they get it from the groundwater. That the Center Valley Project, which is where we're farming, is along the east side, and some of the most productive farmland in the world. If you take a look, you go up that Delano Early Mart area, that's where all of California's table grapes are. Um, down in Arvanetta Sen, you've got potatoes, you've got table grapes, almonds, it's become a big area for cherries and blueberries as well. And you've got the uh, Shafter Wasco Irrigation District. And that's state water. I'm sorry, that's the Federal Water Project. And then the State Water Project, so Kern River, you got the Federal Water, and now you got the State Water, and this is the same water that comes to LA. And so the other districts that did not participate in the other two sources are getting the State Water. So when you add it all together, you have multiple sources of water, and you have multiple different districts. And so, again, if you look at the purple one down here, Arvin Edison, that where we farm, that we're on the, the northeast corner and the southwest corner, we're on Interstate 5 and we're on Highway 58, but we're within the benefit of the Arvin Edison Water Storage District. So what is an acre foot? An acre foot is about a football field a foot deep. And so that's the unit that we're talking about. So when you say you get 745,000 acre feet from the Kern River, it's 745,000 football fields with foot deep. If you take a look at Kern County's water sources and you take a look at average years and you take a look at this year, on an average year, again, you got the Kern River, which is about 21% of the supply. This year, it's only about 5% of, of supply. If you look at the State Water Project, where it's 838,000 acre feet, this year they got a 5% allocation. They got the full bill, but they got a 5% allocation, so they got a 50,000 acre foot. Central Valley Project, where we farm, got a zero allocation, so we got no water whatsoever out of the canal from the Bryant system. You've got local streams and whatnot. Every year, if you take a look at all the creeks and streams that percolate back into the water table, the Kern County gets about 300,000 acre feet of percolation and recharge into our aquifer. And then finally, and then you got the groundwater, which this year now is 90% of the water in Kern County is coming out of the groundwater. We're talking 1,365,000 acre feet. This year, 800,000 acre feet more water was pulled out of the ground than was put back in. And that if you take a look over the last 40 years, that number is about 70 million acre feet of water more taken out than has been recharged back into the basin. And so that's the reasons for the concern is that water tables are dropping. Um, now if you look at, you know, kind of countywide, particularly on the, on the west side operations, but all the districts combined, that you, if you take a look at the lines here, the red line is your usage. These lines are a combination of your various supplies. And so when it's above, all of that water above the red line goes into water banking. And when it's below, all of that water is pumped out of groundwater. And so the districts are banking water and then making withdrawals. If you take a look at the whole basin that, where the usable groundwater is, not all of the areas actually have usable groundwater. Where we farm, as an example, the water has boron and chlorides and um, also has um, uh, 
boron chlorides, and um, gosh, what's the other mineral that really burns our trees? <laughs> so as the water table is being pumped down, we also see the water quality going down, and, and, and you'll see more leaf burn, and the water is less wet, <laughs> so to speak. So anyway, if you take a look at that, that basin, Again, you've got all these water storage districts overlaying this water basin. And what has happened is that, that major efforts have been made to establish water banking. If you take a look kind of in the middle of that brown area there, that all along the Kern River that there's, you know, the first project was 23,000 acres of percolating ponds that were put in and then that was added on by, each of, by other districts so that on these flood years, it's slow to percolate the water in the ground so they would have the capacity to be able to get the water into the, into the ground. A lot of land has been dedicated to water percolation into these into contained basins. Um, so if you take a look with the capacity of these water storage, these groundwater water storage, the future of water is not in building dams, it's going to be in groundwater storage. That the capacity is 10 million, almost 11 million acre feet in the ground, and that over the last, from 77 to 2005, 30, 300 million dollars was invested in creating the capacity to be able to bank water, to put it in and take it back out again. If you take a look, this is part of that 20, 23,000 acre water bank. Basically, water is being moved in from a number of different sources. Uh, again, it's coming from the California Aqueduct, which would be out of Shasta and Oroville. It's coming down the Fryant, the Kern River from, uh, I mean, the, the Kern River and also from the San Joaquin River. And so all of that is being banked in Kern County. It's the reason why we have a county where it only rains five inches and that, that we are in better shape than most other areas because when it floods, we're able to take that water and put it in the ground. Uh, so managing for drought and regulatory changes, that um, if you take a look at the brown area, I mean, the language on this is you, the brown area is what's called D4, that's exceptional drought, as opposed to D3, which is an extreme drought, which is less, to orange, which is a severe drought, <laughs> down to beige, which is a moderate drought. And so if you look, just literally most of the state is in a, is in a exceptional drought. Um, if you take a look at the people that are on the west side, this state water project, because of the fact that they pay for the mortgage whether or not they use the water, that if you look at 2007, 2007, they got 60% of their water allocation, so they had to pay for the other 40%, which cost them about $17 million. This year, they got a 5% allocation, so they're gonna be paying $69 million for water that they did not receive. And that if you go up to Westland's water storage district, which you might say is questionably long-term sustainable, that 25% of the farms in Westland are in, in bankruptcy. Uh, improving water supplies. I think that the first, this is a look at the, the delta, that the Sacramento Delta is the largest freshwater estuary in the Western Hemisphere of North and South America. So Western Hemisphere, it is the largest estuary. Um, and that's kind of how it lays out. It's, it's very, very inefficient though. If you take a look at the Sacramento River, it basically shunts to the side of the delta and out through the Golden Gate Bridge. And so the idea that running water down the river is an environmental benefit, actually, the delta is very inefficient and the water does not spread. It's like a giant clover leaf. And so when they have fresh water releases, and one of the arguments that farmers have is that of the captured water, Agriculture uses about 80% of it, but of the water, that that less than half of it is being actually captured. And having it just shunt into the ocean doesn't benefit the delta, it bypasses it. The other thing is that the pumping plants are down at the south end, and the water's coming in at the north end, and it kind of has to move through there. Um, if you take a look at, at what has happened with the groundwater pumping in a lot of areas is that elevations actually drop, that the water, the soil that holds the water, that those layers in the ground actually compress. And the elevations actually drop. And in the delta that's happening partly for, from subsistence and it's also partly due to the fact that they're really, they're peat bogs and that when they were developed for farming that that ground is oxidizing and dropping. And so there's areas in the delta that have dropped as much as 30 feet. You could be standing in a field and look up 30 feet and see a boat go by. 
<laughs> and if you take a look once again, uh, this was the actual proposed twin tunnels that was supposed to get water that back when Pat Brown was governor, um, that he tried to get a peripheral canal through and that that never did pass. And that the in, any kind of a conveyance or restoration of the delta was taken out of Proposition 1. So there is no money in Proposition 1 for tunnels or for delta restoration. Uh, and again, if you look, what you see is those, land, those, those waterlocked parcels that you see there, there's about 20 different islands in there. And that if, if there was an earthquake of 6.5, the, the berms on these islands are made out of peat moss. <laughs> and that with a 6.5 earthquake, what would happen is those dikes will collapse. It will suck water in. And when it does that, it will create a salt Instead of being a freshwater estuary, it'd be a saltwater estuary, which will kill the delta smelt, kill the the the, the, the salmon spawn, and it will also uh, stop the water supply for 20 million people and for the the thousands of acres of farmland as well. It's one of the real concerns right now. Is a 6.5 earthquake in the delta would be catastrophic for the state of California. Uh, the other factors and the. This is the argument on the Endangered Species Act, is that in the Endangered Species Act, you just are not allowed to take any endangered species. And so when the water is being pumped, literally the, the delta moves backwards and it causes the water to flow backwards. And so, you know, the winter rung steelhead, which are endangered, think they're going to the ocean, but they're really going to the pumps. And the delta smelt and the delta tend to follow the water towards the pumps. And as soon as they start getting chopped up, they stop it. And so the pumps over the last three years, when you talk about the environmental impact in the drought was we had three dry years, but that the pumps were turned off for March, April, May, June, July, and August. And so you couldn't move the water water up into the Los Banos Reservoir and then down the canals. And so when we went into this drought where we only had terrible precipitation, the reservoir, we went into it with the reservoirs empty. Uh, and that things that are not factored in are the effluent that comes from all of these communities that are around the Delta. Many of them don't have tertiary um, filtration systems for their sewage, predation. You've got one governmental in entity that's trying to enhance striped bass, which is an introduced East Coast fish. You've got another group of government people trying to save the Delta smelt, which is a native of China. It came in on the bilges of ships. The, the, the Delta smelt in China is the identical genetic fish, but it was brought into the California in ships. But it is kind of the canary species, and that you have invasive species. You have quagga mussels, and I think you have zebra mussels. The Delta now is covered with, with, with mollusks on the bottom of the ocean, of the bottom of the Delta, that are filtering out the food that the smelt eat. And so when they study the smelt, they look at them and their stomachs are empty and it's because these non-native invasive species are eating up their food supply. Now you get toxic discharges and um, then there's also a lot of small diversions that happen along the way and none of those are taken into consideration when you chop up a smelt, the pumps turn off. Um, now the Bay Delta, um, this is the, called the Bay Delta um, Conservation Program. This is what they were trying to do originally with the Delta was trying to restore it. And that, you know, um, one is to try to get reliable water by putting the tunnels through. The other is trying to have a better ecosystem by being able to move water through the Delta so that it's cleaner. Uh, and the other is getting ready, you know, prepared so that you don't have levee failures, rising seawater, uh, or earthquakes. Um, so again, from a long term, the, the, um, the delta is going to have to be healed. It's going to have to, the, the money has to be spent on it, but they're talking about a lot of money. And um, that, again, this was completely stripped out of Proposition 1, or Proposition 1 would not have passed. Anyway, so we, we covered the state and the, and the federal project, and now if you go down to Arvin Edison, where we are, that as I said, that we, we're just great at water banking right now. It's divided up. If you look in here, this is Arvin Edison. That we have our farm here, and we have our farm on Interstate 5 right here. And so... Um, Again, Arvin Edison just has set up world-class water banking facilities, and that um, if you take a look at the areas that are blue along the edges there, they're kind of hard to see. Those are areas that are getting 
surface water deliveries. And if you look at the lower areas, those are areas that have natural water percolation that is feeding them, so they're using wells and surface water. <coughs> this looks like a complicated slide, but it's really not. If you take a look at Arm Medicine, or at Arm Medicine they basically only have 40,000 acre feet of class one water, but they got 311 acre, thousand acre feet of class two water. And so what that means is that down here, that's their baseline. That's pretty much guaranteed almost every year. And all the way out to 2013, you can see the supply dropped. 2014, it went to zero. Yeah. If they get just to that line, then everybody gets full water deliveries. And if you take a look over history, almost every year we've gotten almost all water deliveries. This is the actual amount of water used, but this is the firm water yield that we get on the, on the 40,000 acre feet. Everything above that, everything above this line is banked, and when they don't get above the line, then they pull off of the wells. This is, if you take a look at the history as a, as a checking account, the blue lines on top are deposits and the red lines on the bottom are withdrawals. And if you look at, you start getting close to where we are today, you look at 13 big withdrawals, 12 pretty good withdrawals, but 9, 10, and 11 pretty good deposits. That didn't change it. So this is what they, this is what's in the bank. The blue is what Arvin Edison has put in the bank. And this, and starting I think in 94, Arvin Edison cut a deal with Metropolitan to bank water. And so the way that that worked was they actually had to put a canal to connect it. Metropolitan is not part of the federal project, so they cannot get any water from the federal project. But if they make deposits, they can make withdrawals. And so we are banking for them, and they paid off our notes. So it took the debt out of the district, and now they're banking water from Metropolitan. And if you look, I mean, there's still quite a bit of water in the bank. If you take a look at the blue line along the top, that is the groundwater in Arvin Edison, average groundwater. And if you look at the red or orange line dropping, that's what would have happened if we didn't get the federal water. We would have gone down. But instead, we're a sustainable water district. And not all, in Kern County, again, they're, 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 we're not all sustainable. But with some of the new legislation, we're going to all be put in the same fishbowl. So surviving the drought, um, first off, you know, when you have zero water coming down the canal, you utilize your water banks. You deficit irrigate, which means, you know, you have to have very accurate irrigation systems to begin with. I think that you'll see that throughout the area that the efficiencies, our farm's 95% efficient on the water that we use. Uh, we use double line drip, and we even use drip on all of our row crop production. Um, fallow, that means you just take it out of production. A lot of people, when you're dealing with the drought that we had this year, basically decided to rotate some orchards out because they were old or they wanted to go to new varieties, um, and then try to find areas where you can buy water farther upstream. And this year, that water cost 1000 to $1,300 per acre foot. And farmers can't pay that but one year to try to keep your trees alive so that next year you still have an orchard. Because once the orchard's dead, dead, it doesn't matter if it rains next year. Um, if you take a look at the top 10 commodities that are being grown in Kern County right now, um, that you, you can see that it starts at grapes, almonds, and if you look at the change, like cotton down here is number nine, and in uh, 1984, cotton was number one. It used to be 1.2 million acres of cotton. California was the biggest cotton producing state. And now, you know, that's one thing everybody took out was cotton because you couldn't afford to water it. Another one you look at that's a high water user is uh, alfalfa. Hey, alfalfa. Nobody eats alfalfa, but you look at milk, and that's the third largest industry. And so, again, you look at this is the, the crops that are here, and you can see permanent crops going up and row crops going down as far as their acres. Uh, so, this year in Arvin Edison, what they said was because there was no canal water coming, the system could allocate out for the first time a prorate of 1.9 acre feet. So, if I go back, and if you look at, I'm oh, sorry. Okay, so I have another slide that shows the water use of various crops. But cherries need at least three acre feet of water. We've got 
This is the property right next door to our house. Vicki and I every morning walk our dog and walk by it. This guy tried to grow his orchard on 1.9 acre feet. And that uh, what happened was he wasn't watching it very much because it was April to the end of September. And in April and May, he used too much water. And then the rest of the summer, he didn't have enough water to water the trees. And the orchard's more than 40% dead. This is a 320 acre cherry block in Kern County, which grows the earliest cherries in the world. Beginning of this year, there was 5,000 acres of cherries. Now there's 4,000 acres of cherries. 20% of all the acres have been removed. And it's been a combination of no water or water the, the quality dropped to where the salts were killing the cherry trees. But you see they're pulling the trees up and, uh, you know, and uh, they're going to go back and try to plant it again. Uh, the alternative is to fallow it. This is another neighbor of ours and what he did is he just pulled out a third of his cherry orchards and then put the water on the other two thirds. Uh, what the growers are doing, though, is, is working on being very efficient. One of the real testaments to how good growers are, are at conserving water is when you drive up Interstate 5 or you go up towards Terrabella and you see that most of the orchards this summer looked like they were still alive. <laughs> and that here you got an orchard that needed three feet of water and got two or one, got 12 inches of water, and the growers are just spoon feeding it. And the way they're doing that is through the new technologies. This is pure sense. We have crop sense units out, and basically it has has a probe in the ground that goes every six inches and that when you water it shows you what's available in the ground so you can adjust your irrigations to you, what you don't want is you don't want them fully wilted at sunrise. <laughs> that's called permanent wilt. And when you see that, that's major problems. Things like blueberries and citrus don't wilt. And so when you get to permanent wilt, they don't show you that they're dying. And the way you, all of a sudden they just turn yellow and for the next five years don't produce anything. Uh, another thing, which is a, an old technology that we did this year, is tensiometers. And if you're in the city, this is something you could consider also. They're not that expensive. I, you know, they shouldn't be 70 bucks, but they're about 70 bucks. And what this is, is uh, if you look, it has a clay, uh, a clay tip on it, and you put that in the ground, and it's, you fill it with distilled water, and that as the ground dries out, it sucks the moisture, and there's a, a, a dial on the top, and if it's low, if you're like at 20, it means that the ground has enough moisture in it. If it's at 80, it means that you're real close to permanent wilt. And so we put 16 of these in our fields, and then our irrigators use that to determine when they had to put the water in the fields. Um, so we covered that. So we're going to talk about a couple of things. This is, you know, everybody was looking at Proposition 1 and, and the other bill that came in that said you're a polluter if you irrigate. And, and nobody was paying attention to this one. This basically was a deal drawn in Sacramento in three days and signed by the governor, so it is law. And is the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. You come down to Southern California and the water down here is already adjudicated. And in the valley, it's not. And so this basically, what brought about a perfect storm was we had the drought, we had the straight attention on wells running dry and subsistence and major groups advocating. You, know, you had communities and, and individuals whose wells went dry. And so this was brought about to try to create a sustainable water in the entire, in, in all of California, but we are part of the greater Tulare, Bake, Tulare Lake Basin. Um, so sustainable means that you don't cause under, undesirable things. And under, undesirable things would be chronic lowering of groundwater. Uh, you, you could have salts coming in like they've got up in Monterey. You can have um, re significant reductions in water quality, uh, land subsistence. Any of these things are considered not good and that uh, we've got all of them. So the draft right now is to say in 20 years we're going to have a balance. We're not going to put take more water out of the ground than goes in. Sounds like a great idea unless you're a farmer. <laughs> that uh, unfortunately, cumulative change in the water table, as I said, that this year, 800,000 more acre feet of water were pumped out than were put back in. And over the last 40 years, 70 million acre feet more have been taken out than have gone back in. So we have a serious issue, not over at Arvin Medicine though, but we're gonna be grouped together with our neighbors in this. And so the economic impact, what they're anticipating is about 185,000 acres in Kern County out of 800,000 acres that's farmed. So one quarter in the next 20 years will have to be idled if we truly reach a balance. And the cost on that, they're talking about 12,000 jobs and $61 million a year in losses, 631. 
Um, the other thing is, is that now all of a sudden you're creating an entities where all those different water districts are now teaming together on this, and you're creating a whole new entity. So it must cover the entire, must be sustainable, must cover the entire basin, uh, and the counties are responsible for areas that are not in districts, which is like going out to Mojave. Um, the Powers Authority developed groundwater sustainability plan by January 31st of 2020. Um, the, 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 the plans have to be in place, so we've got like over 2014, we're dealing with six years from now, that uh, the plans have to be in place. And we have 20 years to reach a balance. It's a really big thing, and it was, and that they didn't have agriculture in the room. Uh, key issues and challenges. Uh, the biggest issues are property rights because if you didn't drill a well and develop your farmland, you may not ever be able to, even though you have ground that's zoned for farming and water that's in the ground. But the guy next to you who did that may have a water right, kind of like the surface water rights. He was the first to use it, so he may be the only one farming. Um, it's going to become more, uh, again, also become a much more market pricing. I think it was, um, it was Mark Twain came through California, you know, during that time, that whole time about the cowboys and the dam and whatnot, and Mark Twain coined the expression that whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting. And so, um, one is property rights that, um, the question is that if you've got an almond orchard that, and that they're going to put meters on the wells and you may not be able to fully water your orchard with groundwater because you're going to be using more than your allocation, and that has not been adjudicated yet. How do you determine who gets watered and who doesn't? Uh, undeveloped lands, like I said, overlying water rights, may lose their ability to ever farm their land, and, um, and the, the priority of current levels of supply are really uncertain. That, uh, an important point is that if the contracted amounts of water had been delivered that were agreed to, there would be no overdraft. So because we didn't get the surface water, now we have a water pumping problem, and now we have state legislation to address the water pumping problem, when the bigger issue is that they're not getting the water deliveries. Uh, market pricing and competition, all roads lead to higher prices for water for sure, and, and higher costs, because you also have to pay, you're creating entities, you've got governmental entities and you've got private sector entities that are coalitions that all require money. Uh, final thoughts, um, again, that currently Kern County receives about half of its annual allocation, and that the, if the lands, there would be no, we would ha not have an overdraft that they were receiving the water that they, that they were entitled to. If you look at the bottom, 1980, permanent crops were 200,000 acres. Now they're almost 400,000, so doubling of permanent crops. And if you look at um, field crops, it was 650. Now there's 400. So 200,000 more went to trees, and 200,000 came out of growing row crops. Uh, now let's talk about the Proposition 1. I'll go through this real quickly. That uh, it, it did pass, right? <laughs> <laughs> that it was called the Water Quality, Supply, and Infrastructure Improvement Act, and it was really a very balanced bill, that it didn't particularly benefit any one group. It, it was like they say you don't want to see laws or sausage being made, that they took out everything to improve the delta out of this so it would pass. It, so it funds conference conservation. Uh, it also leverages about 25, to, the seven and a half billion leverages another 25 to 30 billion dollars of good that will come out of the federal government and other fund, funds that have been dedicated. You've never seen, you know, things are so polarized politically that you had something that both the, 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 the Republicans, the Democrats, the governor were all in favor of. You had the Nature Conservancy and the Natural Resource Defense Council and the Farm Bureau all on the same side on this, and the Sierra Club taking a neutral position, even though in it it said there might be dams. And really the reason why, I'll go down kind of where the money's going. The first one, 520 million goes to safe drinking water. And this basically goes to disadvantaged communities. In our valley, we've got, you know, you got Delano, McFarland, Rosemont, all these areas where you've got cancer clusters and whatnot. The money's gonna be there for them to have cleaner drinking water. 800 million went to the regional water reliability. And some of that is storm water capture and uh, increases in local and regional water supplies. 900 million goes to groundwater sustainability. Sustainability. So that's more uh, working on the basins as far as the water banking. 725 million goes to water recycling, saltwater removal projects. Uh, 1.8 billion of it goes to watershed and flood management, habitat and watershed uh, programs, enhancing rivers, creeks, and some uh, some flood management. 
Um, the big part of the dollars, and this was where people were getting concerned on the controversy, was for new water storage. And it says new surface and groundwater storage, but it's a competitive basis. And the thing that you have to realize is that half of the water that is created goes to environmental benefits. So the people talk about Temperance Flat, which is right above um, Millerton Lake, and put, raising it, putting another dam above it to store more water. If, if farmers were getting all the water, they couldn't afford to build a dam. <laughs> The fact that now they'd only get half of that water, I don't think that you're going to see any more dams in California because you just can't afford, the only people that can afford the water are cities. Farmers can't afford the water from dams. What you're going to see is that 2.7 billion is all going to go into water banking. There's just no feasible, no feasible dam where you get half the water to build a dam that you could afford to do it. 80% um, of Californians identified the drought as the most pressing issue in the state, and uh, the aging infrastructure have not had any new storage in 40 years. It's so great that we did something. If we didn't pass this year, it would never pass. Uh, the state, um, this is the other one I was talking about, and this was when you water, you're a polluter, is basically, it used to be if you're going into a stream into the ocean, then you've got to do really special things. But now when you water, you've got to do really special things. And again, it was the state, Cal uh, the state of California, Central Valley Regional Water Quality Control Board, just made a decision to change it. <laughs> and um, basically, the, the, ex the expectation is that this year it's going to cost us $10 an acre. So in my operation, it's going to cost us three grand. But that the anticipation is going to get up to $100 per acre, which Kern County, 800,000 acres, you're looking at $80 million a year of expense in order to basically justify your farming practices. The water is expensive. Fertilizer is expensive, crop protection chemicals are expensive, people are prescription irrigating, water is not going below the root zone. There is nitrogen in the groundwater that happened 50 years ago, and it's going to be there for a while. Now we're, they're trying to address the problem when the cause has actually changed. Um, it creates new bureaucracies, grower coalitions that overlap water districts and corresponding regulators to, to regulate the fact that you, know, you have to have a plan for your fertilizer, you have to have a plan for your sprays, you have to have a plan for your irrigation. And growers are already doing this, but when they formalize it, it requires a telephone book size forms that you have to complete in order to comply. Um, it's also requiring, you know, there's two things going on. 80% of the oil in California is in Kern County. And then you've also got, we're in, within this basin, the oil fields, like if you're a farmer and they want to drill a well on your property, they've got the mineral rights, they just give you a 30-day notice and come out and drill it. So now with the, they want to have four test wells around around the oil well, and then they want to have test wells around the agricultural wells at a cost of about $250,000 each, when you've already got wells everywhere where you could test the water. So there's some, there's some areas in the language that, it, that is going to be very expensive. Uh, again, written, uh, you know, again, it's, it's one of the other areas in water that I just thought I'd make you aware of. Um, uh, my wife Vicky's here. You know, I also have um, uh, J uh, uh, James, James Gates and also Ryan uh, Richardson came down. I did I did not know that they were coming, but um, if you know Alec um, Alex um, Weiser, that he's got a place down here, and they're going to be staying at his place. But uh, James uh, does all of our receiving of all of our fruits and vegetables and everything that comes in, and then distributes this out. And Ryan uh, in October does all of our um, on-farm entertainment activity. He was the one that put the hats on the ducks and the duck races. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, locally, we do Santa Monica, Hollywood, Woodland Hills, Santa Clarita, and Torrance Farmers Markets. And um, we, uh, on the 58, we have the Big Red Barn. We've got about 40 acres there that uh, we've opened up where we have UPIC. And uh, last month, we had about 40,000 people come to the farm. Uh, at, on Interstate 5, we've got 70 acres. And right now, it's just a fruit outlet store. But uh, we sell almost only what we sell is what we, what we grow other than the nuts. And that when you think about this Central Valley of California, that half of all fruits and vegetables grown in, in the United States are grown in this valley. Number two state is Florida, and they've got 10%. So you're talking half of all the fruits and vegetables in the state are grown in this valley. And so with the water situations, it's a big deal. Uh, I think the other thing, you look at nuts, 90% of all the almonds in the world are grown in here. And there are a lot of crops in California, only grown in California, and most all of them are grown in the Central Valley as well. This is our location on Interstate 5. 
Um, this last year, a couple things I just want to say real fast. We got Small Business of the Year for District 32 from Rudy Salas. We got Best Fruits and Vegetables, Bakersfield, Californian. And we got the Chairman's Award at the Kern County Fair, Best of the Best for our displays that we did at the Kern County Fair. And we're really proud of those. Uh, what can you do? You can conserve water. You can educate others on the importance of water. You can stay up to date uh, on water issues. You can buy local. <laughs> And uh, this is Nikki and I, we just want to say thank you. Thank you, Farmers Market, for letting me come and speak tonight. I'm Kim O'Kane. I'm with the city's Office of Sustainability and Environment, and I've been working with the city for 13 years. And my sole job has been to help residents and businesses figure out how to save water. So I was at a conference last week, and uh, they were the Farm Bureau was there, assembly members, it was uh, lawyers. We were all talking about groundwater and the drought. And uh, Steve had mentioned earlier that uh, the acre foot per water for farmers was going somewhere around 1,300 acre feet. Well, the top sale this summer was 2,200 acre feet. Um, I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable how much water, um, how much is costing for water. So, what I'm going to talk to you today, I'm really going to bring it home. So, Steve talked about the regional issues, the state issues, but I'm going to bring it home to, to Santa Monica. So, I want to talk about where our water comes from, how we use our water, how we can save it. So as, our, you know, as a community, if we use our water wisely, we use less, um, we diversify our water supplies, we manage it all very wisely, we will make Santa Monica even more sustainable than it is today. So every single day, we provide about 11.8 million gallons of pure drinking water to our 17,770 customers. And we do all the work for you. So you can just sit back, relax, and enjoy your life. And I can't help but talk about the actual value of water. Um, this is something that's really important to me, and I don't think we really talk about it enough. As water agencies across the country, we've done such a great job. You just turn on the tap and it comes out. You probably never even really think about your water. You thirsty, you go get a glass of water. You are dirty, you go take a shower. It's always there for you. So the real cost, uh, the real value is, is, is very important. Um, water is still very cheap in Santa Monica. I know we're talking about new rates um, coming up in the next year, but overall, water is still very cheap. So how many of you have ever bought a 16 ounce bottle of water from the store? You probably paid about $2 for that, right? That same $2 in that same 16 ounce bottle, you could fill that 2,400 times with our tap water. So water is very cheap. But to get all that lovely, pure water to your home it takes a lot of work and a lot of infrastructure. And so this is just kind of a snapshot of our water system. We actually started selling water to customers in 1924. We were one of the founding members of Metropolitan Water District. Um, we also have 10 groundwater wells. Uh, we have a new one that's going in right now. We have two imported water connections. Those are our, in, our metropolitan water connections. And we also have two um, treatment plants. They're both in the city of LA. And we have over 250 miles of pipes. And uh, we use something called reverse osmosis to clean our water. So this is like the latest state-of-the-art technology. It literally takes everything out of the water. It strips it so clean, we actually have to put minerals back into it. So this is, uh, this is one of my favorite slides. Um, this is our Arcadia treatment plant in the 1930s. <laughs> Quite amazing. It looks beautiful. You see, I don't know if you can see, but you can see the Santa Monica Mountains in the back. 
And this shot was taken in 2010, just after we remodeled um, our treatment facility. Um, some of you may have heard that um, some of our groundwater was contaminated with a gas additive called MTBE, and we found that in 1996. And after um, litigation and settlements with the oil companies that contaminated our water, we were able to put in this new treatment facility. So it went online in, in 2010. And this is actually located in the city of LA, just at the corner of Bundy and Wilshire. So you've probably never even seen it. It's behind a little fence, and uh, but that's where all of the water comes in before it gets treated and sent to your home. So where does Santa Monica get its water? Um, we, have, we get about 1% of our water from recycled source. That's our Smurf. Um, it's the Santa Monica Urban Runoff Recycling Facility, and if you've ever been to the pier, you might have noticed a very tiny little facility. Um, it, it, it's actually taking urban runoff, so the water that's literally just thrown into the street during the day from sprinklers, we capture that water, we treat it, and then we use it for landscape irrigation and toilet flushing in some of our newer buildings. Um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's one source that we have. It doesn't produce very much water. Um, we are looking at repurposing the Smurf. So many people are ripping out their lawns and sprinklers and putting in climate appropriate plants that where we used to get about 350,000 gallons of urban runoff a day, now we're only getting about 80,000. And most of that's coming from the city of LA, actually from Brentwood, which we don't have any control over. So, um, <laughs> so we, we, we'll still collect that water and treat it, but we're actually looking at uh, at supplementing that water um, and, and taking uh, brackish water. We actually have a groundwater well right next to the pier. We used to take that brackish water and send it to the Arcadia treatment plant to soften the water. And then when we went to reverse osmosis, we no longer needed to soften the water. So we're looking at actually still using that well water, but just putting it to Smurf, treating it, and sending it to our customers. 40% uh, is coming from Metropolitan Water District, and as Steve told you, that water is coming from State Water Project, Colorado River Water, banking. Um, they have a lot of different sources, and so 40% of our water is coming from there. And then 60% is coming from our local groundwater wells. So this is a map of all of the um, groundwater basins in LA County. There are five basins. We collect our water from the Santa Monica Basin, which is highlighted up there in, in the orange. Um, it is an unadjudicated basin. So that means that anybody could come in and start pumping water out of there. Um, all, other, all the other four basins are adjudicated, so they have rights. They can only pump a certain amount of water out. Um, we. Um, all of, the, all of, well, I should say, the primary groundwater wells that are in the Santa Monica Basin that we pump out of. Um, we have a few in Santa Monica, but our largest producer is actually in the city of LA. It's, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of Windward High School. Uh, we own that land. We lease it to the high school, but our biggest producing well is actually located underneath their sports field. And then uh, we pump it up here and treat it and send it to you. Um, when we do groundwater, it's very uh, cost effective for us to pump it and treat it. It's actually 60% less than what we purchase from Metropolitan Water District. Right now, we, uh, we can supply our groundwater at about $380 an acre foot. Uh, we're purchasing Metropolitan Water District water right now for about $943 per acre foot, and that is expected to rise to $1,200 by 2020. So I like this picture, it's kind of like, you know, the straws in the groundwater, just everybody's trying to put their little straw in. We did a um, groundwater study in 2011, and what we found was that the Santa Monica Basin has about 300,000 acre feet of storage. So if you remember what Steve said, think of that as a football field one foot deep of water. So there's quite a bit of water in that storage, and every year we take out about 13,000 acre feet from that basin. Uh, we've been pumping out of there for over 100 years. We've been doing it very prudently. But in order to manage it effectively, we still need to recharge it. And that recharge comes from rain. And with the unprecedented drought we've had, last year we only had four inches of rain here in Santa Monica. Uh, we are concerned that you know, we, wanna, we wanna manage it appropriately so that we don't get into an overdraft situation. So in 2011, our city council decided uh, that they wanted to make sure that we had a long-term plan for our water. And so they developed a goal to be water self-sufficient by 2020. And what that really means is we want to stay within our water footprint. We want to stop importing water from Metropolitan Water District because as you've heard tonight, um, 
that water supply is, is unreliable, especially given climate change, and we don't know how long this drought is actually going to last. Um, so the way we're thinking of this, and we've developed a plan, and last Tuesday night, Council adopted it. It's our Sustainable Water Master Plan. We've been working on it since 2011. It includes um, a roadmap for how we're going to get there. That's adding three new wells. One of them is going in right now. It's going in on Olympic Boulevard. We're going to be able to pump about 300 um, uh, million gallons um, out of that. And um, we're, that's just one. We're doing a pilot project there. So there's new technologies on how to pump. So we were, we're testing out these new, more energy efficient pumping and treatment uh, facilities or equipment. So we're going to test that. Um, and that's going in right now. We're also looking at increasing conservation. So in order to stay within our footprint, we need to close a gap of about 6,500 acre feet. Part of that's going to come from the new wells. Part of that's going to come from conservation. So it's going to take everybody, every resident, every business, cutting back just a little bit more. So every single day, this is how many customers we serve. Um, of that 11.8 million gallons, we have about 91,000 residents, we have 7,000 businesses, and we get about 200,000 daytime visitors. So those are either people who are coming to recreate in Santa Monica or work here. And this is how our water use is broken out by customer class. So single family customers are about 24% of the overall usage. Um, there are about 7,500 single family homes in Santa Monica compared to multifamily where there, that's about 51,000 individual apartment units or condo units. Um, and, and they take up about 68% of our total water use. And then the customer, uh, the commercial class is about 28%. And we have a little over 2,200 accounts. And then we have a few accounts for fire sprinklers, uh, landscape, and our recycled customers. So landscape, yeah, I heard landscape. Um, we have landscape only customers. So like the parks, in our parks, um, the school district has, you know, their sports field. Even some commercial businesses, they have a dedicated meter that for the water that you're just going to their landscaping. And we have a few um, single family homes that have their own landscape meter as well. So after three years of very sunny and warm weather here, um, it's, it is impacting our local water supplies. We have two of our very small um, production wells in Santa Monica um, on San Vicente Boulevard. Um, we, we've seen those two wells start to lower a little bit. Um, we aren't concerned right now, but we are watching those closely. Um, and then obviously, you saw this graph earlier, uh, the imported water that we're getting from Metropolitan is certainly being impacted as well. I love that sign. Um, serious drought helps save water. So um, in August, um, our city council went from an advisory voluntary 10% reduction goal to a stage two water shortage, which is now a mandatory 20% reduction from baseline 2013. And so this is something that's going to impact every customer. Um, it includes something called a water allowance. Um, every customer will get a water allowance and they'll have to stay within that water allowance. If they go over that, then they would have to pay something called a drought surcharge. And all of that will be starting in uh, 2015. So this is um, our baseline. 2013, we were using 11.7 million gallons per day. In 2014, our water use has gone up. We're using about 11.8 million gallons per day, although the last three months we have seen a small decline. So overall, this year, we've only reduced about 2% compared to 2013. Um, our goal uh, to get to that 20% uh, we need to cut back 2.2 million gallons per day, and that gets us down to 9.4 million gallons. So that's the target, and we need everybody to step up to the plate and help, because this is something um, that we all face, and we're all part of that solution. So how do you do that? Well, first you've got to find out where you use your water, right? So whether you live in a home, a single-family home, or a condo or an apartment, um, your toilet's using the most water, uh, followed by your clothes washer, uh, your faucet, and leaks. Um, so yeah, if you have a small dripping leak, fix it. It's wasting water. <laughs> Okay, so how much do you really use? 
So the average single family home in Santa Monica is using about 22,440 gallons um, per bill. So we bill every 60 days and that equals 30 HCF. So we act, on your bill, you're, you'll actually see HCF. That's 100 cubic feet. So one HCF is equal to 748 gallons. And for a single family home, we estimate that about 50% of your use is actually going to your landscape. Compared to multifamily, where the average multifamily unit is using about uh, 6,700 gallons per bill. So that's nine HCF. And um, only about 10% of their total water use is going to the landscape. So what does a 20% reduction look like for the average customer? Um, well, for the average home, that's about 4,400 um, uh, gallons that you need to cut back per bill. And for a single uh, multifamily unit, that's 1,300 gallons. But wait, I've been saving all this time. What about me? How is this going to affect me, right? That's what we all want to know. So if you live in a single family home, I just talked about water allowances, and you're, you would not be, about 42% of our single family customers would not be affected by those water allowances. Uh, we recognize that Santa Monicans have done a lot to already conserve water, and we want to reward them for that instead of penalizing them. So if you use 22 HCF or less per billing period, you would not be required to save an additional 20%. You would not face additional drought surcharge. So go home, look at your bill, see how much you're using. Um, and then for our multifamily customers, they use water very efficiently. 80% um, of our multifamily buildings would not be affected by the water use allowance or drought surcharges. Um, so they, they're actually using um, water very efficiently. So if, if they use 11 HCF per bill per unit or less, they would not have to reduce that 20%. They would not get a drought surcharge. So how do you use less? How do you get into that 20% reduction? Um, well, I'm going to talk about five steps that you can do right now. The first one is take five. So. If you really cut your shower to five minutes, you could actually save 1,400 gallons per bill. And if you use one of those really cool shower heads I gave you out that are sitting out front, you could save even more. So the shower head you have at home right now probably uses about two and a half gallons per minute, and the one out here uses 1.5 gallons a minute. So if you're in the, in the shopping mood, you, you, you see this one, Take one for yourself. If there are any left, take one for a friend. Um, but if you need to go to the store, make sure you are looking for products that have something like that. That's the water sense label. So this is something that EPA developed a few years ago. How, you've probably all heard of Energy Star. Well, this is the EPA's version of that, but for water products. So anytime you see the water sense label, that means it's been third party tested and it meets very strict water saving criteria. So you, you can feel confident in buying something that has that label. I talked about those leaks. So check your home. If you have that little dripping faucet, if your toilet is running in the middle of the night, if you've got a broken sprinkler or a sprinkler that kind of weeps after it's turned off, those are all leaks that add up to that 15, that 13 percent of water use in your home. So fix those. It's something that's really easy to do. And the toilet swap. So you already all have low flow toilets, but now there's something even better. They're called high efficiency. And again, you want to look for the toilets that have the WaterSense uh, logo on it or the label on it. That can save you about 850 gallons per bill. And we have a rebate up to $100. Um, I've seen these start as low as $89 at some of the big box stores, and they go up to a couple of thousand dollars if you want the low boy that's in black. So you just pick what you want. But they, they are um, inexpensive. That it does not mean they are cheap. Um, they are, like I said, very high quality. And wash wisely. Um, if you install or replace your older clothes washer with um, a newer Energy Star one that has a water factor of four or less, then you could save about $1,800 per bill. And our rebate is up to $300, and the gas company offers an additional rebate. I've seen uh, clothes washers recently as low as $500 in Santa Monica. So our rebate combined with the gas company almost covers the full cost. 
And then Go Green, this is one of our most popular rebate programs right now. Um, it's up, if, if, you, if you go green, you rip out the lawn, replace your sprinklers with drip irrigation, you could save about 2,600 gallons per bill. And our rebate currently is at $3,000. Um, when we go back to council in January, we're going to ask them to increase that to $5,000 um, per property. And um, basically what it is, is three components to this program. There's cash for grass, so that's where you remove lawn, put in climate appropriate plants and mulch. And mulch could be bark, gravel, decomposed granite. Um, that's $1.50 a square foot. And then if you want to irrigate those plants with drip irrigation, we'll give you another dollar. So that's two fifty a square foot. And um, drip irrigation, we have a parts list. You can buy it here locally at Smith Pipe and Supply. And then the third option we have right now is for uh, water saving sprinklers. Um, and we also have a parts list for that. And now you all are going to be water managers. So congratulations. Every time you save water, you really are helping our community thrive. You're making sure that you're saving water and staying within your water allowance, and you're going to avo avoid those higher water charges and drought surcharges. So I really encourage you to take the steps I've talked about. They aren't that hard to do. We're all in this together. We can't do it without your help. So these are just some of the tools that we have coming up. Um, if you live in a single family home in Santa Monica, you might have already gotten an email or you might be getting a letter very soon for something called My Water Report. It's basically um, an online engagement software system, something fancy for just a, a better tool for you to manage your water. Um, you're going to get a home water report. It looks like this. You'll get it every um, um, every two months. It will come as a supplement to your water bill. And it's actually going to have information about your water allowance and how you're staying within your allowance. And then you, it, you're going to compare yourself to your neighbors with similar size homes. And so you'll get that information every two months. And then it's going to have specific tips about how you can save water at your home. And how do they give you specific tips? Well. On that survey that you're about to get, you can tell them all kinds of good information. Or you can go online. They're going to have an online profile. You can add information like, oh, yeah, I just fixed a leak. Oh, yeah, I just got a toilet with a WaterSense label on it, so I got my $100 rebate. So you have the ability to input that information, and then it will give you additional tips, and it will actually show you how you're comparing to your neighbors and, and how much more you need to save to stay within your water allowance. And another tool we have coming up um, November 15th is our uh, Rain Barrel Sales event. It's going to be um, at Sustainable Works at Santa Monica College on Pearl Street. So you, this program's great. Uh, we've given out hundreds of rain barrels to these events. Um, the cost of the barrel is $150. You reserve your barrel online, and then you pick it up the day of the event. We're going to have myself and my coworker Russell there to talk about our rebate programs. Smith Pipe and Supply will be there to sell you drip irrigation, and Armstrong's going to be there with some climate-appropriate plants. So if you can make it, that's great. If you can reserve a rain barrel in advance, even better. And our rebate after um, after the rebate, uh, that, re that rain barrel will be free to you. And you can get up to eight ra rain barrels through our program. So what is the city doing to save water? Um, I guess I'll start with this library. Um, this library has the very first cistern that was installed in Santa Monica. It's underneath the parking lot, and it's a 200,000 gallon cistern, and we use it to irrigate all of the landscaping in and around the library. And then we just put another cistern in at the Pico Library. That's a 12,000 gallon cistern, and we're using that water to, to uh, flush toilets and urinals. So we had a little bit of rain in uh, March. It filled up that tank, and we were able to use it for over a month to flush toilets. And then if you remember, we got like a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of water in June. It filled it up about a quarter of a way, and we got two weeks out of it. So um, something we're really proud of, um, that cistern being used for toilet and urinal flushing is the first of its kind in LA County. So we're really proud of that system. We talked a little bit about Smurf already. Um, 
our water treatment plant, uh, we're putting in that pilot treatment plant right now uh, for the new groundwater well because we want to try out those new technologies. If those technologies actually save um, energy and pumping um, and, and, and uh, more efficiency in, in how much water we use, because you've got to use water to treat water. So if we can reduce the amount of water we need to treat it, um, then we're going to take those same technologies and put it in the Arcadia plant, which is that large plant that I showed you at the beginning of this, of this slideshow. We're looking at all the city facilities, and we're going to be putting in new toilets and urinals, all those high-efficiency ones. And um, we're also looking at um, our parks, our open spaces, medians, and trying to find ways where we can rip out lawn, put in climate-appropriate plants, take out some sprinklers, and put in drip irrigation. So those are the things that we're going to be working on over the next couple of years. And that's it for me. So thank you. I think we're going to open up for questions now. Thank you. <laughs> See, it says drink Santa Monica water. <laughs> Freshly brewed today. So we're just going to open it up to questions if you guys have any. We're here. So Laura, thank you. It's so good to see you. <laughs> so Steve, I wanted to ask you, I see that Kern County Water Basin has a very effective groundwater, whatever that is, where they recharge. Is that the only water district, water basin in the state that's doing that? Yeah, there's, I think there's 22 districts that t to make up that Kern County region, but I think that Kern County has the most advanced water banking in the state of California. We have people from all over the world come to see these, these water banking facilities. Arvin Edison sits over a contained basin, so where it, what it puts in basically it takes out. When you bank water, you're only allowed to take out 85% of what you put in, so you can't take out more than you put in. But um, as you go north, like on that, on that um, the, the, the federal water project that goes along the east side, a lot of the districts to the north of us have no water banking, and so when they got their zero allocation, they got zero allocation of water for their trees. There was growers that had citrus groves that got four inches of water for the year. To keep trees alive, you need about 12 inches of water, minimum. <laughs> That's just so they don't die. It doesn't mean that they're going to produce fruit the next year, but they won't die. And that um, there was, you know, there's maybe 20,000 acres of citrus that that won't make it through this winter, but. Those districts don't have the water banking. I think when you look at the $2.7 billion, that I think you're going to see some of that money go into more water banking. But again, half of that water that is banked will have to go to will go to environmental benefit as well. But um, up and down the valley, that um, nobody has the banking that Kern County does. So what would it take to put in water banks? How long? How much money? I mean, you said there's going to be some, but that would be how many years from now? Well, in Kern County, I think over the last, what was it, over the last 10 or 12 years, they put, I, 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 the, the slide I had, how, how many millions of dollars? I think they put $20 million in. So, the, the, you know, it's not that expensive. Basically, what you have to do is set aside farmland and, you, and convert it into basically uh, wetlands. <laughs> because when it's wet, you're... you're Percolating and ducks and wild, you know, migratory wildlife come in, and um, we're actually recreating. Uh, to the north of us was Tule Lake and Kern County. We had Buena Vista and Kern Lake, which, you know, back in the old days had, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand Indians living around them. Now they're gone. That's Boswell. <laughs> <laughs> so again, it would, it's a matter of retiring farmland. So what happened in Kern County was they bought out that farmland and retired it and then created water banks, put levees around it, and built the infrastructure to, to deposit and to withdraw. It's the expense really is putting in the well fields. You know, and long term, if you start putting solar panels over these percolating fields, then you'd have a secondary benefit of being sustainable on energy. Because right now, you know, when they turn these well fields on, that they're the single largest stationary power users in the county. Just to pump the water? Just to pump the water back, yeah. They locked in. These projects went in back with when these big water projects went in. They had excess power. And so they got into some long-term power contracts where they have lower costs. Right now, the water costs are lower than the solar panel costs. <laughs> but as those water costs go up, there's a point, a tipping point where solar panels make sense. Vicki? For both of you, Steve, you showed a lot of overlays and <laughs> so many systems and structures and and so many aspects of, of water in current county. Would you both speculate that all counties have that 
kind of a mumbo jumbo, intense. I, I can't even imagine how it can be managed and how it can be fixed and how it can even be talked about. Is it that complicated in every county? So the question was, is is water complicated in every county? And the, the answer is yes. It, it's like that. I'm mean, one of the slides you had. Or, or I think Jody said earlier, there's over 600 different water districts in the state of California. 300 of those are in Southern California. So yeah, it's very complicated. Um, the Sustainable Groundwater Act was trying to help look at this as a whole system and manage it that way. But when you have all of these existing water rights and everybody has their own groundwater management plan, is it really, does it really mean that they're just going to keep their own individual plan but lump it together in one big plan? And then you have all of these cooperative agreements that have to be written up and how is that actually going to be managed? It, it's still very much up in the air. We're not sure what's going to happen, but we do know for sure that adjudication is what's happening. I mean, everybody's starting to look at that and figure out how they can adjudicate their water supply right now so no one else can touch it. Yes? I, I missed the very beginning, but I can't really, I couldn't really tell. Are you, are you for, are you glad the Proposition 1 passed, or did you have problems? Oh, yeah, I think that, that in the last 40 years, there's been no new water storage of any kind other than what local communities have done and local districts have done for water banking. And so $2.7 billion go towards increasing water storage. As I said, I don't believe any dams will go in with that money. I believe that it'll all go to groundwater banking projects. Um, the benefit to disadvantaged communities, the benefits for cleaning up and, and improving watersheds, um, it just in all aspects that it was a very, Nobody got what they wanted, which usually is a pretty good compromise. What Jerry Brown wants to do with the Delta, with the tunnels, what's your opinion on that? You know, the problem that we have is that the water is coming in at the north and it's being taken out at the south. And when you pump it through the Delta, then you, you get involved with, in the Endangered Species Act with the, the winter run salmon and the Delta smelt. And there's no tolerance, no economic threshold of any kind. When you start killing smelt, you turn the pumps off. And so it has to be addressed. Secondly, the Delta is just ill. It's the largest estuary in, in the Western Hemisphere, and it's sick. And that uh, there needs to be a lot of restoration, a lot of respects. So the water is stagnant. That water doesn't move through that Delta. When it floods, and the, when Sacramento River water goes down the river, it doesn't infiltrate the Delta. It just shunts right through the bay. And so, you know, originally when they were talking about peripheral canals, they were talking about release points around the Delta to improve the water quality in the Delta. Uh, they were looking at ways that they could do it with the least amount of environmental impact. So they look at these two tunnels going under the Delta and going back up to where the Sacramento River comes in and taking it down to Tracy where the pumps take it out. And that in agriculture, you know, the cost of putting that system in the billions and billions of dollars. I had a slide that talked about how many billions, I didn't memorize it, but agriculture could not afford that. And what agriculture's concern was that it didn't create any new water. You put in multi-billion dollar project and there's no more water. It just gives you a little bit more dependable water supply. It really would benefit Metropolitan. So you're against it? No, I think that it has to happen. And, and when you look at who's gonna pay for it, the users are gonna have to pay for it. It's just, you can't have the whole state where one 6.5 earthquake and there's no more water, you know, 25 million people lose their water in Southern California. So it is going to have to be fixed, but it was not addressed in Proposition 1 and that uh, the controversies are that, you know, that Northern California doesn't, doesn't want to export their water for the benefit of Kern County or Los Angeles for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I was just up there above Shasta, and they were really pleased to have snow from a couple of small rains because there was no snowpack. Um, and it was very frightened, the rural people. And they do have the conspiracy feeling that the cities are going to take everything. And they do believe they're going to be left behind, and the environmentalists, and it's just uh, very fierce. You feel the water war feeling up there. <laughs> Um, my town is out of water. I, my well still has some water in it. Um, I'm curious, is there an overview for the state of California? Right now, I'm only optimistic about California for the voting pattern that just went down a few days ago. California did make some common sense. Do 
you think there's an overview for water use for the state of California so it's not city versus country? Well, with Proposition 1, that gives, I think, what was it, $800 million to disadvantaged communities with um, wells that have gone dry or having water quality issues. So this does put water into getting water to those communities where the wells went dry. I mean, it's, fun, it's money for it. That's what it, was, that's what it funded. <laughs> And, and even locally, um, you know, just in the last few years in Southern California, we've spent over $15 billion in storage for cities. So we recognize that we, we don't want to take all that water from Northern California. We want to be independent. And so we've invested heavily in, in storage and, and water banking, and um, we will continue to do that. I know we know that. Fox News says we don't. <laughs> Another thing is, I mean, you look at the L.A. River, you know, and it's just a, a canal. They, they try to get into the ocean as fast as they can. And that, the, unfortunately, the land's so expensive around it that how do you take out residential areas and put in percolating ponds? Call this Australia mm -hmm. and do it. Mm -hmm. At the level of the federal government, they're doing it. Who is it inside the Beltway that is concerned with water? Department of Interior, I don't understand the question. Is that it? Yeah. Thank you. But it's not a national topic. Nobody in the federal government is really talking about water. It's something that needs to change. Because until the president starts talking about water, it's not really going to, nothing's really going to happen here. That's the big stuff that needs to be done. Steve, when you talk about the farmers paying the mortgage on this water, whether they have it or not, they still have to pay for it. So was is so there are some state water projects that, that they have to pay for. I mean, who who owns the water in California? When they put who in, owns that snowmelt? Where where does that all? When they built Lake Shasta, mm -hmm. when they built Orville Dam, when they built the canal, they brought it from there to Los Angeles and put in Los Banos Reservoir, and then. Uh, the distribution system, all of that became a mortgage. And so water districts take that water and then distribute it to their growers and their growers are assessed property taxes on the property tax bill and then they get assessed a using fee. When you use the water, you pay a fee for the water. And that, you, you have an assessment whether or not you use it. So, so the farmers who have lands that, when the water projects came through, growers at the time had the choice of participating or not participating. So if your lands participated, then you, are, you have to pay your share of the infrastructure cost, the mortgage. Um, if, you, if you didn't participate, your land will never be irrigated and has no value. I mean, Central Valley farmland, I mean, it, you can it takes 40 acres for one cow, and you might make $150 on a cow, so farmland with no water has no value. I mean, one of the big issues that we have right now is that just this last week, most of my time was spent explaining to my banker where my water comes from, because it, the basis of my property values are based on the fact that I've got water, and my potential to have income is based on the water. Without it, the land has no value, and I have no income. Did you inherit those water rights when you bought the land? I mean, you can't go out now and get those. I mean, no, you can. There's no new water. Yeah. I mean, no new, no state or federal water to lands that have not been historically participating. If you are within the benefit district, there are people in the benefit district where their lands are taxed, where. You know, if somebody put in the Dahon shopping mall, you know, you might be able to move that water onto land within the district, but if you would have to be within the district, within the benefit district. If you're outside of the district, then you can't get it. Chris, I'm going to bring it back to more like a local issue, I guess. Um, so these, you know, new implementations are going into place where, you know, if you're conserving water and if you're staying within your limit, there's not going to be sort of any penalties for what you do. Um, but is there anything, I guess, long term to sort of combat people who, you know, I mean, I know, you know, with Santa Monica is not Brentwood, but, you know, the people who have, you know, the, I guess, the wherewithal and the income that are like, oh, I'm just going to pay the overages. I'm going to keep my lawn green. I'm going to use what I want. And it's sort of going to be on the backs of people who are at the mercy of conservation. So is there anything? We're going to call it sh social norming and shaming. <laughs> um, yeah. Unfortunately, there will be a minority of people who 
will pay whatever it, it costs to use the water the way that they want. Um, but that's a very small percent of the people that will be doing that. Most people, we can see their water use has gone down a little bit. Like I said, the multifamily properties, they have been saving. I mean, that's, they really, they're, they're, they understand the importance and they're doing it. Um, it's a little bit easier for you as an apartment renter to, you know, cut back your showers, but for a homeowner, you have to make that investment, right? You, you, you're gonna have to purchase toilets or rip out your lawn and your sprinklers. So there's definitely an upfront investment. Um, you'll reap the, the benefits for sure, but you've, you've got to invest upfront to do that. Kim, do you have those slides online? I'm gonna, they will be a part of the um, city TV, yeah. But I could post them if you're interested. Okay. Has anybody done a computer run to say if this continues, how much uh, our food yeah. disappears? Or how, how, how long will it take us to become like Libya and Tunisia? We don't have the rain. We're not the only area in the world where we're having water problems. If you take a look at Iran, if you go up, that Iran has a million acres of pistachios. California has a quarter million acres of pistachios. All the pistachios in California are on the west side of the valley where they've got 5% water allocation. In, in Iran, India, or not India, Turkey has put in 187 dams on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, rivers. And even before those dams, that they did not have sustainable water, that there is no recharge going on. It's, just, it's dinosaur water that they're pumping, and their water tables are just going down and down and down. And 10 years from now, you're going to find that Iranian pistachios are going to be seriously impacted because not only is the water dropping, but also their water quality is dropping. And the same thing is happening in California. Literally, the world pistachio crops are grown on questionably sustainable water supplies. What about basic things like tomatoes and other uh, greens? You know, the, the, a lot of the vegetable crops are grown, you know, again, if you, when I was showing the charts on the row crops that people stopped, you know, as an example, there was a lot of people wanted to talk to us about pumpkins. You know, when you are a farmer, what you do is you stop growing wheat and you stop growing cotton and you stop growing alfalfa and the last crop you plant is the pumpkins because you make money on it. And the same thing if you grow tomato, tomatoes or lettuce or one of the things on one of the charts was a little bit deceiving is that these row crops may take half as much water, but most row crop grow get two crops or two and a half crops in a year so you end up still using four acre feet of water per acre but the money is going to go where the value is if they're making money growing vegetables if they're making money you know growing almonds or pistachios then you see actually drying up I mean they won't be able to do that I mean if this lack of water is in this crop I mean how long has it been going on for and we have just woken up yeah, it's been going on since the beginning. That, uh, but what's happening is that we're just seeing more and more market-driven water prices. I mean, you take a look at cities, they can only use 18% of all of the captured water. And so after the cities get what they need, then the rest goes to agriculture. As cities grow, they're going to chew at it, but they can only use 18%. So you look at the rest of it within the agricultural area, it's all going to where the value is. If you look at the history of California, you know, it started off that you had Native Americans and then you had Spaniards, and then the cattle mitten came in and started irrigating pastures and they could survive droughts. And then they rotated into the vegetable crops to feed to the gold miners, and then that shifted into the peach trees and the stone fruit, and then that moved into the almonds, and there's just a evolution towards the highest value. And so if you're, if you're, if you're netting $3,000 an acre growing almonds, then you can pay more money than a cotton grower can. And so people stop growing cotton. Um, the dairy industry is bringing 70% of its grain in from the Midwest to feed the milk cows in California on train cars. Uh, sorry, I had to I believe that a lot of this problem with the drought here is because of uh, the chemtrail in the sky. I don't know if we talked about that, but I, I, um, California's got the worst drought than anywhere else in the West. And I think it may be partly due to that. There are websites you can check. I'm sorry, I don't have the name of those websites. Uh, my friend told me about them, but I think that there is something going on with the uh, chemtrail in the sky, and I believe that that possibly is causing a lot of the drought here in California. <laughs> because it's a lot worse here than anywhere else in the country. And I don't think it's just, you know, a, a, a cyclical thing. I think there may be something else going on, okay? I'm saying maybe, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it's worth working into it. 
when you cut uh, the, I mean, I guess when you look at the bristle golden pine that was cut down up in uh, Bishop, that I guess the guy was really quite a great environmentalist, but he was he did a coring into a bristlecone pine and then they wanted to save his auger so they cut it down and it turned out to be the oldest living thing. <laughs> <laughs> and as they look at those growth rings that you can see for the last 2,000 years, the precipitation patterns, and we've had droughts when the Anasazis left Arizona that, that, that there was a 40-year drought. <laughs> and so we have seven-year droughts that are not all that uncommon over the, and you can see it on the, on the, on the tree rings, but I mean, you go back to 1863, 1864, that that eighty percent of all Spanish land grant holders lost their farms because fifty percent of the cows in California died from a three year drought so severe that the cows died it, back then you weren 't taxed on your property you were taxed on your cattle, and when the cow, half the cows died, eighty percent of the Spaniards lost their land on a three year drought Laura. What are you most concerned with being a farm for the next five years? What, you, what worries you the most? What do you think is going to happen to you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know uh, since you asked that question, that there are a number of factors that make it that the margin in farming is very narrow that uh, around the world has been the industrialization of agriculture and with that has been increased efficiencies of scale. And so you have large operations that, uh, you know, the large operations are the majority of the production, even though you might have a, a large number of new farms coming in on smaller parcels. The, the, the driving engine in agriculture are the larger corporate farms. And it used to be, you know, when I grew up, my father had a had a 60 acre citrus grove in Riverside and that he sustained his family on it. And today you can't sustain your family on a 60 acre orange grove doesn't make enough money to put your kids through college and survive um, there's just a whole tidal wave of things that are making farming really difficult right now if you if you sit and talk to a group of farmers and say what do you think is going to happen over the next five years they're going to say water shortages labor shortages and new pests and the new pests that are coming in by themselves are so draconian you've got the glass wing sharpshooter with pierce's disease that literally killed my vineyard I had to pull it out 60 percent of the vines were dead in one season you've got spotted wing drosophila where all of a sudden you've got maggots in your cherries and your berries and that there are organic sprays for it but we went from never using any insecticides to, to going with organic sprays that have to be done regularly because these flies are migrating in from the orange groves where they're on all the rotting fruit so you got you know and now you've got the citrus psyllid which spreads along long bean and that if you go to florida you know this thing came in and then irene came in hurricane irene came through and spread it throughout the state and now where they had 800,000 acres of oranges now they've got 400,000 acres and, the, and half of those living orchards are dead and now we've got the citrus psyllid in california and they found long long bean in on a pumalo in los angeles that somebody imported it in so you're not going to see organic citrus in five years it's not going to exist because it's such a small bug you can't net for it so you got bugs you got drought as you know uh, you know in our business you know we we are an average size farm but because of the diversity of the business that we have that we go from 60 to 80 employees so going into next year that if we decide not to give them health insurance it's going to cost hundred and sixty thousand dollars if we do give them health insurance it's going to cost us three hundred thousand dollars I mean that's January 1st we didn't make a hundred and a hundred and sixty thousand dollars last year if you take a look at the minimum wage going up gosh you know the people are the hardest working most beautiful people you've ever seen and that we have great sustaining we don't have an employee that makes in the on our farming operation that makes minimum wage but when it went up a dollar an hour so we went up we just floated with it it's going to go up another dollar an hour. we'll have a 25 percent increase Half of all the fruits and half of all the fruits and vegetables are grown in our valley. The argument is these people can't afford to buy the fruits and vegetables that they work in. But when labor goes up 25 percent, fruits and vegetables are going to go up 25 percent. But it's hard to raise prices. There's there's a, a ceiling on the pricing. But you know we've got. Um, you know, I mean, and, and it, granted, it's, it's really good stuff, but we just, just immediately now, there's three days of sick leave for all employees. So for us, that means all of our employees get three more days off a year. You've got um, health benefits. You've got the increases in the, in the, in the um, wages that I just see that, um, 
you know, if it wasn't for the fact that we put in a Chevron gas pump at our store, that we would have been able to have paid the medical benefits of our employees. So I'd say I worry more about going broke. <laughs> and again, it's not, I mean, you can't have the government go from $4 trillion to $17 trillion of printed currency and not raise people's wages. <laughs> that, that, uh, how, did, you know, how did these people, you know, another issue that we have right now that is that farm workers, their overtime is at 60 hours. And so we have people, ours are year-round employees. Our employees work with us all year round, but a lot of work is seasonal. And during, when the working is good, the workers, you know, if, if you were to knock it down to a 40-hour work week, those workers would get a second job and work those other 20 hours <laughs> because they, they want to make the money and send it home. <laughs> and so I think that you'll see this year that the government, you know, we have a huge labor shortage. The, 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 if you look at the, the dynamics of the um, in Mexico of their population, their population has peaked and declined. And after NAFMA, more people are staying at home, and people are returning home because there's better jobs now than there used to be. So we don't have, you know, it takes, you know, with the, we have 160 acres of cherries. It takes 400 people for three weeks to pick the commercial side of that, and that uh, we needed 400 people, we had 120, and that. You know, the price of cherries drops like a rock, you know, over a course of two weeks. And that uh, the fact that it took us two extra weeks cost us $100,000 because we just, that you cannot get anybody in town here. You got, you know, unemployed people. You, can, you know, you can't get anybody to come out and pick cherries. And these people were making $160 a day. You know, but they're, that, that, that there's a perception that farmers can be mean to workers. Workers have choices. They're, they're, you know, when you've got signs in the grocery store saying, go to Fresno, you make $10 an hour working in the grapes for raisins, you know, the, the, the workers have choices that the olden days of either being able to be mean to your, or mean to your workers is gone. <laughs> that, um, and so for me, labor shortage is probably the biggest issue. Water shortage is, without water, you just don't have anything. Water, labor, and uh, and pests. <laughs> Anybody else? Just one more question for Steve. You were saying that a lot of these regulations were passed. You said there were no farmers in the room. Yeah. So they, what's happening with that? Well, right now the the one was the one was changing just changing it from. Water, if, you, if there's runoff off your farm and it goes into streams, then you have to be very seriously, you know, monitoring and reporting and, and justifying your choices and fertilizers and other inputs. Now they said just when you water, you're a non-point pollution source. And so that decision was made by a room full of people that just worked for the, for the, the water control board. They, they, you know, they're appointed positions. But the other one where they, this whole adjudication of the Central Valley, that from a grower's perspective, they felt that because of the way that the water districts are in place and that the water has been managed for the last, you know, 70 years, that it would have been better to have worked with the districts on how you adjudicate the water. Arvin Edison is in balance. Some of these other districts that are not in balance, you know, that first you cut off the surface water deliveries because of the Endangered Species Act, and secondly, you put monitors on the wells and cut them out of the well so you can't get surface water and you can't get groundwater. That that decision, you know, that the industry asked the governor to veto it and allow industry to come in and help make a better bill out of it. But there was no farmers, there was no water districts, no people in water that were involved in it. Clearly, there's a huge problem. <laughs> You know, I was at a conference last week, and the director from the Farm Bureau was there, and the assembly um, staffer who, who helped write that, and they talked about the, the 13 different workshops that they attended, and the Farmers Bureau was there, and they said they participated, and they were in full support of it, so that's, that's what I heard. I'm on Farm Bureau, and that's not true. <laughs> I'm on the executive board, so... So if we don't get rain this winter, then what? It's just be catastrophic. That a lot of people were able to spend the extra $1,300 an acre foot to keep their orchards alive for one more year with the hope that it's going to rain. That, uh, you know, if, if, you know, I'm hoping with Arvin Edison that there's a, a, a normal year. I mean, the irony is that if you take a look over the last 100 years, that there's been 15 years that were within 20% of normal. 
So we just don't get normal years. It's, it's usually way more or way less. <laughs> but if you can be anywhere in that normal range, then where we are because of the ability of Arvin Edison that we could take the water and, and, and not have to have and get a normal delivery. Um, the guys that are out in the middle of the valley floor that are running wells and they've sucked 800,000 acre feet of water out of the ground, it's going to take time for that water to percolate in and move over and replenish their water table. So uh, it's going to take some sustained wet periods for the state of California to really get past this. But normal rain would be a great thing. And if it's as dry as it was this last year, that you just will see not just tens of thousands of acres, but a considerable number of acres that will not come out of it. That you look at the infrastructure that's in place in California, when you drive up through 99 or the 5 and you look to your left and your right, there's just the envy of the world what it produces and, and fruits and nuts, and that it's an infrastructure of huge investment. And when the water becomes unavailable, your banker doesn't loan you money, and you don't get the money to replant it again for fear it might happen again. What, you know, what do you go and put in? You know, it's twelve, sixteen thousand dollars an acre to develop a new orchard if this could happen again in three years. So if it was another bad year, not only would it be economically devastating to the citrus industry, to the almond industry, to the pistachio industry, to the grape industry, it, this year was already devastating on the grapes, that it would just literally be death to those fields. And on top of that, it would be death for them to be able to get financing to replant. Well, that's it for tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is this one on? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody, for coming. A few just like last minute housekeeping announcements. We do have our library panel series for 2015 all set. So make sure you pick up a card and hold the dates. Come see us. We're always also looking for great volunteers at the farmer's market. So there's a flyer up at the front. Thank you so much. Safe drive home. Thank you.